What an incredible privilege to be here. I count it a privilege to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere and here. Uh, the greatest honor of my entire life, a great privilege. Ezekiel 37, if you turn with me, the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. And you might have heard the story about a woman who came in and landed in New York after a long international flight, took some time, you know, clearing uh, immigration, baggage claim, customs, she's exhausted, gets to the curb, hails a taxi, collapses in the back seat, gives the cabbie the address to her hotel. The man says, well, uh, you know, ma'am, it's going to be a long drive in this traffic. It'll be at least an hour till we get there. She said, that's fine. I'm going to go to sleep. You just wake me up when we get there. Some time goes by. She's sleeping peacefully in silence. Eventually she wakes up and she's looking around wondering where they are, so to get some information she leans forward and taps the cabbie on the shoulder. As Soon as she taps him, he screams bloody murder. He swerves into oncoming traffic, barely misses a school bus, comes back into his lane, misses a garbage truck and finally pulls it to a stop on the curb and sits there panting, gripping the wheel with white knuckles. She said, sir, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. He said, listen, ma'am, it's not your fault. It's just today's my first day driving a cab. For the last 20 years, I've been driving a hearse. I don't think any of his customers ever woke up. You know, as pastors... If we are too familiar in dealing with death, we also will be surprised when we encounter life. We're going to read a scripture, and it's a very involved scripture. I'm going to look at it very simply, though. And it's a story about a man whom God says, I want you to speak life into some dry bones. As pastors, we're called to speak life. Amen? I want to preach a sermon this morning called Speaking Life, Ezekiel 37. Read with me, beginning in verse 1. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked at the sin I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. So he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army speaking life. I want to talk first about the question of life. You know, the difficulty in ministry is that often we are asking the wrong questions. Think for a moment about the prophet Ezekiel. As God brings him into this valley, it says that he walked back and forth among these bones. And you've got to realize that what he was dealing with was a picture of carnage. Listen, this was not like skeletons from a high school uh, biology class laying in neat rows all put together. The idea is of a battle that was lost, and so there would have been dismembered skeletons. 
right? There would be skeletons with no skull. There would be, uh, maybe there were corpses there uh, with arrows still there in the bones, in the rib cage. And so think about the questions that could have gone through Ezekiel's mind. He would have been thinking, what on earth happened here? Why did they lose the battle? How did it turn out this bad? And all in all these questions he could have spent uh, much time thinking about. And probably the biggest question in his mind as God is leading him in this vision, he would have been thinking, what on earth does God want me to do about this mess? Right? Now the problem is, is a lot of times as pastors, we look at our churches like that. What is wrong with this person? Oh, come on, pastor. Looking at me all religious. I have never thought that in my life. Can we talk to people? We think, well, how did they get so messed up? We, how did they, you know, what was that pastor thinking? Have you ever been in counseling and then all of a sudden you stop to think, am I on candid camera? I had a couple call me in a church I used to pastor. They were brand new, and they said, we'd like to get relationship counseling. Now, I know now that that should have been a giveaway. But I said, yeah, sure. And so I meet him. So, uh, how long you been married? He said six years. She said four years. <laughs> and I just laughed. <laughs> you don't remember when you got married? He said, no, I've been married six years. She's been married four years. And you know, pea brain here took me a few cycles to work it out. <laughs> You're not married to each other. <laughs> right? And as pastors, we think these things. What on earth is wrong with this church? What do you got a plate in your head? But see, that's not the question that God was asking Ezekiel to answer, was it? He didn't say, Ezekiel, what's wrong with these bones? He wasn't asking him uh, what caused the malfunction. He wasn't asking him why they were dead. The point is, if we're asking the wrong questions, we'll get the wrong answers. In our scripture, it shows us the ultimate question of pastoring, and that is very simple. Can these bones live? In verse 3, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Listen, this is the ultimate question of what we do as ministers of the gospel. Can this church live? Can these disciples live? Can this city live? That is the question that God is asking us to answer. As pastors, we need to answer the question, could these men go out and pastor them? Could this church be a church planning church? Could these pastors be stirred once again? Even for ourselves, the question is often, can these bones live? I know we come to conference sometimes, and the question is, am I going to make it out of here alive? Right? Listen, I have come to conference as dry bones thinking, oh God, is there any way you could ever do anything in me? This is the question. It's the question of life. And so what we see in our scripture is that as pastors, the question of life is actually a question of what we see. It's a question of vision. In our scripture, it's obvious what the prophet sees. In verse 1, a valley was full of bones. In verse 2, he says, indeed, they were very dry. At this point, all he can see is dryness because that's what the eyes see. And here's a great danger of ministry is if everything we do is based on only what we can see in front of us. Because how many of you know we're good at seeing the problems, aren't we? Ezekiel sees dryness all around. We see problems naturally. This is uh, easy to perceive. A common question I've been asked by disciples is, how do you preach on problems? Or how do you preach on issues? Or in other words, how do I preach at only what I can see? Right? These are, uh, you know, the questions like, if people are not giving, how do we preach and make them give? 
If they're not praying enough, how do we hammer them and make them pray? And the idea uh, of that is that all we're seeing is the problems. But see, in contrast, in our scripture, God sees something totally different. Ezekiel sees a valley full of dry bones, but God sees a mighty army. Listen, God sees your church differently than you do. That was weak. Oh, amen, maybe. No, I've got the mind of God. I can see my church. In Judges 6, Gideon says, I'm worthless and I'm nothing, but God sees a mighty man of valor. In John chapter 4, the disciples see a woman who uh, she's uh, uh, unclean and she's got a bad reputation. They don't even pay her mind. The scripture says they didn't even ask Jesus why he was talking to her. Yet what did Jesus see? Jesus saw a key to a city or to a people group because God sees things differently. So the question is, do we have vision for our people? When our preaching says you're a mess but doesn't offer any hope, that's because of a failure of vision, right? In Proverbs 29, it says without a vision, the people perish. Think about that very simply. It says the lack of vision is connected to death. Can I tell you something? That's true in preaching. If our preaching has no vision, we are ministering death. I have heard sermons where I'm convinced that pastor would be happy if I jumped in front of a bus. Come on now. Oh, you're so worthless. You lazy, dirt bag, filthy. But listen, when there's no vision being imparted, that's death being transmitted. That's the spirit that does not bring life. It is easy to see the problems. That's my point. But can you see with eyes of vision? Pastor Mitchell said on Monday night, the gospel is about what God can do. What you can become in God. It's not about how messed up we are right now. It's about what God can accomplish. And so the question, Pastor, when you get up in your pulpit on Sunday morning, what do you see in the broken people, in the dry bones in your congregation? What is the vision you've got for them? And I would say it matters very much to your people that they sense that you believe in them. I'm not talking about self-esteem, all right? I'm talking about having a vision for your people. So let's talk second about God's answer for dry bones. See, if we're not careful, we can misinterpret God's question. In verse 3, he says, Son of man, can these bones live? And the tendency is to assume that God is speaking in generalities. Like, do you believe in miracles? Do you believe that bones can live? Or do you believe in conversion? Do you believe in restoration? And I would say that probably all of us would agree. We'd say, yes, bones can live. Oh, yes, God can do miracles. Yes, God can restore backsliders or even people that hurt us. We believe that in generalities, but that's not what God asks, is it? He didn't say, son of man, can bones live? He said, son of man, can these bones live? He wasn't asking him about the brother across your city, about his bones or his church. He was asking about these locally, son of man, can these bones live? Can these people be resurrected? Could this church come alive? Listen, the reality is, is that's a whole different question altogether, isn't it? It's easy for us to say, oh yeah, praise God. I believe that God can do miracles, but it's a whole different question when God's asking you about the people that you look at every Sunday morning. Can these bones live? Now the truth is, that's a question only God knows the answer to. So look at what Ezekiel says. He makes two statements. First, Ezekiel makes a statement of faith. Verse 3, he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Listen, that is a statement of confidence in the potential of life. He's saying, God, you know they can live. 
You're God. Of course they can live. Listen, the point is, when God is involved, isn't there always the potential of life? You know, sometimes we, we make jokes about it. Oh, it would take a miracle. Of course it would. It took a miracle to get you saved. Right? When Jesus is there, there's always a potential of life. When Jesus walked in where the dead girl was, he said, uh, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. But, but she was dead, right? The medical symptoms were dead. You know, there's a technical term. Many of you know Gary Riley. I used to work for him. And my first phone system that he let me install by myself, I blew it up. When I powered it up, it made this cool sound. It sounded like applause. Shh. And the smoke went. So I called him up. Gary, um... I hate to uh, tell you this, but I, there's something wrong with the phone system. So he asked me what happened. He said, what color was the smoke? Uh, gray, I think. He said, oh, yeah, there's, a, um, there's a, an old term uh, for that. It's a technical term. When you release the magic smoke, it's D-E-A-D, dead. You know, the girl was dead. When Jesus walked in, she wasn't taking a nap. Right? That was, it was not a miracle because he woke her up from a deep sleep. This girl was dead, but listen, it doesn't matter what the medical signs are. It doesn't matter what the family sees or the other disciples see. When Jesus is on the scene, there is always the potential for life. And it doesn't matter how old and dry the bones are that you're preaching to. If you can get Jesus in that building, there is always a potential of life. So the desperate need for pastors is faith for the people we pastor. We need to have faith that they can change. We need to have faith that they will change. We need faith that they can grow together uh, into a mighty army, not sitting around bad-mouthing the congregation. Oh, did you see who showed up late today? Oh, can you believe what they said? Do you have faith that they can change? Because the truth is, faith is still the activating element of ministry. Still, it, 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 faith is the absolute necessity. In Mark 5, the little girl, everybody else gave up on her. But Jesus said, no, I see this differently. And so here is Ezekiel's first answer. He says, God, I am confident that these bones can live if you're involved. Ezekiel makes a second statement, and it's a statement of strategy. Verse 3, he says, Oh, Lord God, you know. Think about what he's saying. God, you know. That word, know, uh, can be uh, translated to reveal or to show. Literally, he's saying, God, you will show me. Or in other words, God will give me the answer for this situation. When facing dryness and death and a setback, Ezekiel didn't go and buy a book on dry bones ministry. Thank God. He didn't fly to some church in Florida to see how they handle dry bones. Right? He said, God, you know. In other words, God, you've got the answer. They say today, eight out of 10 people are using Google to self-diagnose illnesses. Doctors say the problem is, is that the diagnoses are either incorrect or incomplete. And so now they've coined a new term called cyberchondria, which I think means I'm so dumb, I think I'm dying of something I read about on the internet. That's the technical term, I think. But you know, the real tragedy is they never called their doctor, right? They're spending all their time doing research and never ask the doctor. Listen, here's a revelation about life is that God knows the answers. How deep is that? 
God knows the answer to what's going on. In John 6, verses 5 and 6, Jesus told Philip, Go buy bread that these may eat. But then it says, But this he said because he knew what he was about to do. In other words, God knows ahead of time what the answers are. God knows before we even encounter the problem. Listen, pastor, God knows how to fix your church. Wow. You know, that's true. It's in the Bible and everything. This is the confidence that we can have is that number one, God knows what needs to happen. Number two, God knows who might be the answer. You know, sometimes the key to your church is someone that comes in. Sometimes it's someone that goes out. But God knows who it is, right? Just a, a few weeks ago, I was being vexed. We have so many new converts in our church in Gallup. It is just exploding and this one couple was just just getting weird you know new converts and you go oh man and so I just went to prayer God I know someone's speaking to them you just got to tell me who it is and two days later the couple that was following up on them called me said you're not gonna believe this but so-and-so uh, you know numbskull who left the church he's calling the new converts so just tell me his name so I can pray against him that's all I need right God knows who is the answer and also, God knows the strategy that you need to implement. And so God knows the answer. And biblically, God is willing to tell us in Psalm 48, 14, this is God. He will be our guide even unto death. It says he's going to guide us or give us direction for our churches. And so here is the critical need. is learning to go to God for the answers. Go to God for the answers when we're facing the dryness of ministry. God's got the answer. When we don't know uh, what the problem is with us or with the person or with the family, God knows the answer if we'll go to God. You know, the problem sometimes is that as pastors, we sit there and we stew in our irritation. Oh, and we'll open our phone to call our wife, and we'll see that other person's name. Ugh. And then by the time Sunday comes, we've got a sermon that is so venomous. Because we never went to God for the answer. God, what's the answer for my church? In Matthew 17, the disciples asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast this out? Right? That's wisdom right there. They went and nothing happened. Jesus, why isn't this working? What's wrong in my ministry? How do I fix this? In John 9, the disciples were misguided, but still they went to Jesus. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In other words, they weren't looking through some book. They weren't calling some other brother. They went to Jesus for the answers to ministry. So here is Ezekiel's second answer. God, I trust you to show me how these bones will live. So let's talk finally about speaking life. Our scripture has a fascinating progression. In verse 3, he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones. Think about that for a moment. God comes to uh, his man. He says, how is this going to work? And he says, God, you've got the answers. And God says, okay, you speak. Listen, there might be more in that that I'm not seeing, but something very simple and very practical is that the healing of broken people is always going to be dependent on men who will speak life. God didn't say, oh, I'm glad you got it. Congratulations, now I'm going to do my miracle. He says, okay, Ezekiel, now you speak life. Listen, pastors, if our church is going to live, we're going to have to speak life into them. We're going to have to speak vision into them because God's method for changing lives is the preaching of the gospel. So then that brings a very practical 
question, and that is, what does it mean to speak life? There's two things that our scripture teaches us. Number one is that speaking life always involves speaking about the future. In verse 4, he says, prophesy to these bones. Very simply, the word prophesy means speak about a future event. That is what speaking life ultimately is, is God told Ezekiel to speak about a hopeful future outcome. He said, speak about the potential of what God can do in their lives. Not where they're at now, no, but speak about the future, what God can do in them. Ezekiel didn't get up and say, you wicked dry bones. If you weren't so stinking dry, we could do something. But instead, I'm going to have to do outreach all by myself. Right? That's not what he said. In verse 6, I love this. Uh, uh, sorry, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, I will cause breath and sinews and flesh and life. He's saying, speak about what I'm going to do for them. Speak about what's coming down the road, the miracle, the potential of the future. In Hebrews 6, 9, he says, Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Think about that, confident. That means we are assured. We are, uh, we, we know this is going to happen. We believe this for you. And he says, I'm not confident that you're going to screw up like you did last time. He didn't say, beloved, I am confident that I'll be writing this letter again next year. He said, beloved, I am confident of better things for you. Listen, this has got to be part of all of our ministry. And what a, yesterday, uh, Pastor Ruby preached a convicting sermon about discipline and these issues. But, you know, uh, did you catch the issue of discipline is not kicking butt for kicking butt's sake? There's life. There's future. Listen, hey, this didn't go right. That was stupid. What are you, stupid? As my father would say. But we can do it different next time. There is potential in counseling. Listen, there are times when we're counseling, and you know all we're doing is counseling, is just being the, oh, yeah, okay. Because they don't want to hear it sometimes. You've been there? All they want to do is all over your desk. Okay. But, you know, maybe we could go into that like, you know what, God's going to help us today. God's going to do a miracle in your marriage. I bet you there's some pastors, if you said that to somebody in your church, they'd pass out. Were you just nice to me? Don't point. In discipleship, even dealing with issues, listen, there can be life. There can be life in every facet of ministry. In verse 6, he says, I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin. He didn't say, hey, you're messed up. You ain't got no skin. He said, hey, God's going to put skin on you. Same message, right? Totally different approach. One message brings life and is speaking about the promise of God. And so listen, ministry that speaks life has got to be focused on the future. Ezekiel is patterning a type of ministry that's focused on what God can do, not on how man has failed. In the midst of failure and lack desperation he's speaking life he's saying oh don't come on folks don't worry about it we got this God's gonna help us through God's gonna get us to the other side we're gonna have revival in this church I know everybody has told you that we're all washed up and dead but there's something better coming this is ministry that speaks life there's a better future there's a hopeful outcome for you or in other words it's the difference between preaching that meets their need preaching that beats them up with their need. The second thing we see in our scripture is that speaking life must involve the supernatural. Listen, if all we're preaching is self-help and self-improvement, we've missed the mark. 
We're not uh, getting it. Uh, in verse 9, he says, Prophesy to the breath, son of man, and say, Thus says the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Think about this. He's saying now it's time to trigger the supernatural. Think about how glorious it is, Pastor, that we could get up and preach and people would meet God. That's the most wonderful thing. If you get them into the altar, let them touch God. All you got to do is speak life into them, get them there with just a little bit of hope. If you'll get them to the altar, they'll meet God. What did he do? He just preached. He just got up and said, God's going to help. And there's a supernatural element unleashed in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4. He says, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Our preaching has got to be with power. We don't need the religious world, you know, 12 steps to 10 keys to that, 101 helpful hints. Forget all that. Preach the gospel and the power of the Holy Ghost. Get involved in people's lives. And can I, can I just throw this in here? In this story, this congregation, figuratively speaking, went from dry bones to a mighty army. You know, all it took was a simple declaration. It didn't need some uh, razzle-dazzle, high-powered, amazing uh, show. He didn't have to be like, come on, bones, put your hands together. I can't hear you. They weren't doing nothing. But he preached, and they stood up. Are you with me? You know, that gives me a lot of hope. Because there is a lot that I can't do. And the fact that God could use his word to stand up a mighty army. Here is the wonderful promise of our scripture. Is that God gets involved when God's men speak life. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. All he did was speak life, and they stood up a great army. Listen, if we will preach life into our congregations even the driest of dry bones and stand up and live summer now we've started street preaching in Gallup street preaching is like my favorite thing in the world and the first time we went out we had more than a hundred people out there street preaching actually we had so many people there was one person preaching they've never been to church before I have no idea who they were How did she get the mic? (laughs) But I'm looking and there's, you know, the kids and the teens and the elderly. Oh, come on. Listen, there's life if you'll speak life. 1967, two linemen were working on a utility pole. Apprentice J.D. Thompson, senior lineman Randall Champion, Champion was knocked unconscious by 4,000 volts of electricity. He was left dangling upside down by his climbing harness as a horrified crowd looked on. Apprentice J.D. Thompson quickly climbed down to where Champion hung him, just doing what he was trained to do, administered mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Champion recovered, and he lived another 35 years. A photographer was there, took a picture of the moment, and it went on to win a Pulitzer Prize. The picture was called The Kiss of Life. But in one of the newspapers where this picture ran, the byline underneath it said, The drama of one man breathing life into another. That's what we're called to do as pastors, amen? Let's welcome Pastor Haynes as he comes.